We are continuing our series simply called So Great a Salvation. All of mankind is in a sinful, fallen condition, but Jesus Christ has saved us from that sinful human condition. We need to understand exactly what Jesus has done for us. We need to know what it means to be saved. You know, believers use the word saved or salvation a lot, and yet most don't really understand what those words mean. They think it's referring to just being born again and going to heaven, but it certainly includes that, but it's so much more than that. We need to know all that this great salvation provides to us. Hebrews 2, 3 says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We can't neglect it. We can't be indifferent to it. We can't be nonchalant about it. No, we need to take hold of it and believe all that it provides for us. It is so great a salvation. It's absolutely amazing. And so we need to know exactly what it includes. The words translated as salvation or save, they mean to rescue, to deliver, to heal, and to make whole. Jesus has provided all of that for us in so great a salvation. He has redeemed us from those things in the sinful human condition. And one of those things is sickness. Ever since the Garden of Eden, when man fell, there has been sickness in this world. And Jesus came to redeem us. He provided for us healing in so great a salvation. In the original biblical text, the word, the Greek word in the New Testament that so often is translated as save is sozo. It is also used many times, depending on the context, in reference to healing. In many of the miracles of healing that Jesus did, the word there is sozo, the same word that other places is translated as saved. And you just, we need to get this. This is part of our salvation of what Jesus has provided for us. It's so crucial that you know that healing is part of this great salvation because if you don't know it's part of it, you're not going to believe for it. But it was also a vital part of the message of the gospel, the good news. I'm telling you, it's good news for a sick and hurting world to know that there's a healer that he has provided for us to be healed. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in those three Gospels, it's recorded in the Scripture that when Jesus sent the disciples out to preach the kingdom, he said, preach the kingdom and heal the sick. It wasn't just Jesus doing the healing. He sent his disciples out and he told them to heal the sick. At the end of Mark's gospel, the very last chapter, near the end of the chapter, Jesus tells them, he says, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then he says this at the end of it, he says, they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, you see, a lot of believers today, they believe in the great commission to go and preach the gospel but they leave off the part about laying hands on the sick. I don't know why, because Jesus said it in the same, at the same time, and it was always part of his ministry when he sent his disciples out. They were to preach the gospel, but also pray for the sick, to lay hands on the sick. And so you need to know this is part of the good news for a hurting world. And it's amazing how that still in our generation, many times on the mission field, there are all kinds of healings taking place. It's for us too. The problem is sometimes here in religious America, well, you know, we've learned better. God forbid. We need to hold to the promises, the truths of the Word of God, the things that were true then, they're still now. His Word doesn't change. You know, under the Old Covenant, the Lord healed people. I mean, how many of you have read the Old Testament? Okay, some of you. 
If you've actually read it, you know. There were times that God healed people. There were times when God healed a whole bunch of people. It's in there. But under the new covenant, we have a better covenant. The Bible says we have a better covenant. Under the new covenant, Jesus has paid the price for our healing. He has provided it for us in so great a salvation. You know, the book of Isaiah is really amazing because it holds several prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was written 700 years before his birth. One of the things that Isaiah wrote about was the virgin birth. Absolutely amazing that it was written 700 years before. But there's another passage that is also amazing. In Isaiah 53, it is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus. And I just want to read a couple of verses this morning. Verses 4 and 5. It says, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Anybody believe that? Amen. Amen. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of, for our peace was upon Him. Anybody believe that? Amen. Do we believe the last part? Yes. By His stripes... We are healed. Jesus bore wounds on his body. When they whipped him with that cat of nine tails, it left wounds all over his back. Those were stripes. Those stripes purchased our healing. He's already paid for it. It is part of so great a salvation. I don't know why people want to separate this out from the rest of it. It's for us. It is part of what Jesus paid for. He purchased our forgiveness, our freedom, and our healing. You know, this Old Testament prophecy is also referred to in 1 Peter 2, 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. We talked about that last week, right? By whose stripes... You were healed. And there it is. He quotes Isaiah here. By whose stripes you were healed. Peter knew that it was for us. Written decades after Jesus died on the cross. Peter knew that it was for us. You know the problem with preaching? What the Bible says about healing is that there are certainly times that we don't understand why someone wasn't healed or why healing didn't come the way that we thought it would. It raises difficult questions in our minds and it's just easier not to talk about it. And I can tell you as a preacher, it's way easier not to preach about it, but I have to. Amen. I'm compelled to Amen. because there's so many people that need healing, and it is part of the gospel. We are full gospel. Amen. We believe in the whole gospel, not just, not just, hey, we're going to heaven. See, some people, that's all they believe, we're going to heaven, nothing else. no. I believe in the full gospel, and this is part of what Jesus provided for us. He bore wounds for us that we might be healed. You know, we could just go along with what's socially acceptable. We could comply with the religious culture of the day about healing. But healing is one of the greatest needs of man, even in our day. With all of the advances of modern medicine and, 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 you know, so many great things happening through medicine. And yet, still, it is one of the greatest needs of man. And it is also one of the greatest promises of the Word of God. And there's so many promises and so many examples of this throughout the Scripture. We need to believe the Word of God. I know some of us have difficult issues with healing. I understand that almost all of us have had times that, you know, 
we were believing for healing for someone and it didn't happen or and sometimes people we prayed for even passed away. I know that nobody lives forever in these corruptible bodies. Yes, our final healing will be when we take on an incorruptible body. You know, sometimes there is pain and heartache and loss in this life. You know, in the last 10 years, both of my parents died and both of Carmen's parents died. And I certainly understand that there are difficult issues that arise here in our thoughts and in our minds. But none of that changes the Word of God. We cannot interpret the Scripture in the light of our experience. This is such a dangerous thing where people, you know, rather than holding to the truth of Scripture, they just kind of reason it out and figure it out on their own with carnal thinking, with the reasoning of man, and and they just kind of make their own truth. That's what's going on in our culture. There's only one truth. It is the truth of God's Word. we got to hold to the truth of God's Word in regard to healing. Don't ever interpret the Scripture in the light of your experience. We interpret our experience in the light of Scripture. I'm telling you, the natural mind of religious people will try to make the Word of God fit their experience rather than living by faith. It doesn't take any faith just to accept things as they are. It takes faith to believe God. The substance, Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's not living by what you see. It's the evidence of things not seen. And we need to understand that we are called to live by faith. And I believe the word of the Lord will build our faith this morning. Jesus told the religious people of his day, Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29, and the NIV he said it this way, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. This is how people get in error. They don't know the scriptures. Now, I can assure you that those scribes and Pharisees that Jesus was talking to, they knew some scriptures. But Jesus tells them plainly, you're in error because you don't know the Scriptures or the power of God. And we certainly, we need to dig into the Word of God. How blessed we are in this country to have the Bible so freely given to us that any any of us can have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you see me after the service, I'll give you one. There's no reason for anybody in our country to not have a Bible. And we need to dig into the Word of God and know the Scriptures. That helps us. That keeps us from getting in error. And we need to know the power of God, that our God can do absolutely anything. But so many just use worldly reasoning to decide what's right. They want to keep it safe and comfortable and socially acceptable. You know, don't want anybody to think I'm one of those weird religious fanatics. I'm one of those weird religious fanatics. I believe in healing. I've seen it. I don't even just have to go by the Word of God anymore. I've seen too many miracles. But even if I don't see any, I know that His Word is absolutely true. Now, some religious people, they'll say, well, God doesn't do that anymore. They'll say it stopped with the apostles. That's weird, because it didn't start with the apostles. Why would it stop with the apostles? You know, even in the Old Testament, even under that old covenant, David said in Psalm 103, verse 3, he says, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. David knew it. Same one that forgives all your iniquities, he heals all your diseases. People keep wanting to split it out. But so often it's hand in hand together in the Scriptures. The same one. David knew him that way. Forgives all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. You know, some people believe that, well, you know, so God healed in the Old Testament. And he healed in the New Testament until the apostles died. There's not a single verse of Scripture that says that. Not one. Not a single one. 
That is nothing but the reasoning of man trying to make the gospel socially acceptable using, you know, I mean, we want people to be able to understand our gospel and, you know, that miracle stuff. We got to do away with that. I'm going to hold to the Word of God. Now, I don't have to have this myself, but if this helps somebody else, I want to share this with you. For hundreds of years in the early church, they recorded miracles. Many, many, many miracles that happened. Miracles of healing. Not, it didn't pass away with the apostles. It's recorded in history. Then through the dark ages, you didn't see much of that because the gospel wasn't being preached much. But then, when any time in all of the great revivals of history, I mean, even in Martin Luther's day, he recorded evidence of, of miracles happening. John Wesley recorded over 240 miracles of healings that took place in his ministry. This has always happened, and yet there's always people that don't believe. And the reason that we don't see more miracles is unbelief. The same was true even when Jesus was here. In Jesus' hometown of Nazareth, you know, the people had no respect or honor for him because they knew of him. They knew his family. And this is what the Bible says in Mark 6, 5 and 6. It says, now he could do no mighty work there. This is the Son of God. This is God incarnate in the flesh. He could do no mighty work there. Not He wouldn't. Except that He laid His hands on a few sick people and healed them, and He marveled because of their unbelief. Now, there's something really good in these verses here. Even when they were surrounded by unbelief. I mean, Jesus marveled at their unbelief. Yet, there were still some. There were still some that got healed. And I want you to know that even in the midst of an unbelieving world, even if none of your family believes in healing, even if everybody around you is telling you that's not for you, you can believe for healing and be healed. It might make it harder to stand in the face of all that unbelief, but you can, you can still be healed. I want to tell you, when people don't believe, it doesn't shake my faith, because I know that even when Jesus walked to this earth, and he did miracles of healing and healing and healing, even raised people from the dead, and yet most people didn't believe. Isn't that just crazy? Doesn't that boggle your mind that they saw Jesus healing people doing all these miracles, and yet most people didn't believe. Why are we surprised when people don't believe today? Miracles happen and they just try to explain it away. The doctor says, you have lymphoma, you have a cancer. You go to the next doctor, yes, you have cancer. And then all of a sudden, well, it's not cancer. Just went away. Well, you're one of the lucky ones. God. He does miracles. So many just rationalize away the miracles that God does. Religious people will say that, well, he might or he might not heal. But my Bible tells me that God does not show favoritism to anyone. Some act like there's some kind of a spiritual roulette table where we pray and we cross our fingers in hopes, you know, not really hope, but in wishing, you know, maybe we'll be one of the lucky ones. It's not about luck. And it's not about God sitting up in heaven and saying, well, you know, I like you, but I don't like you. You know, you never see that in the ministry of Jesus when he was healing people. 
All kinds of people came to him. But you don't see one turned away that came in faith. But one of the most notable things about the ministry of Jesus were all the miraculous healings. He had such compassion for people, such compassion for the sick. He still does. He still does. He cares. He hasn't changed. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't know why people keep trying to change him. I like him just like he is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always going to be the same. You can't change him. The Bible says he doesn't change. Malachi 3, 6, I, the Lord, do not change. Don't try to change him. Now, if you believe that, that God doesn't change, then when we hear this next verse, we need to take it as though God is speaking to us because He doesn't change. Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord who heals you. Here's a word. If you don't get anything else this morning, He says, I am the Lord who heals you. I am the Lord who heals you. That doesn't change. He doesn't change. His word doesn't change. I am the Lord who heals you. We need to take him at his word. I'm telling you, believing is the key. Mark 5, 22. We're going to go there and read through this passage, but we'll just kind of work our way through it as we go. Mark 5, 22. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. Now, I want to say this again. I'm going to say it several times this morning. The New Testament was written in Greek, and in the Greek text, when this father says, Lay your hands on her that she may be healed, The Greek word there, again, is sozo, the same word that is translated as saved. Now, he's talking about her being saved from this illness. But I want you to understand that this is part of our salvation. This has been provided for us, and we need to know that it's for us. Verse 24, so Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood 12 years and had suffered many things for many uh, physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. 12 years. That's a long time. It seems like an eternity when you're sick. I mean, I've been sick for five days and it seemed like a really, really long time. You know what I'm saying? What's 12 years like? And for some people, it's longer than that. But the scripture tells us specifically that she suffered many things from physicians. Sometimes doctors and medicines help, but this wasn't one of those times. All the doctor's treatments just made her worse. And I want to say this very plainly this morning. I want to say this very clearly. Hear what I'm saying. The Lord can use doctors and medicines But our trust is always in the Lord. He's our healer. No matter how healing comes to us, you see, if you go to the doctor, go to the doctor in faith, pray, and believe that God's going to use that doctor to help you get well. If you're going to take medicine, pray and believe that God's going to use that medicine to help you get well. But you do it in faith, Trusting God. You know, back when Carmen was dealing with cancer, we learned to understand this principle. Do you realize that there there was a time when Jesus spit and made mud and put it in a man's eyes to heal him? There were other blind men that Jesus healed that he he just spoke something or he he just says, according to your faith. I'm I'm telling you, he didn't even touch them and they were healed. But this man, he gets some mud and puts it in his eye. Sometimes God uses something. And so there's nothing wrong with that. But whatever you do, you do it in faith. 
believing and trusting in your healer. But I also want to tell you the answer isn't always a specialist. The answer isn't always another medicine. But the answer is always Jesus. However it comes, He is always the answer. Verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, this is real important, she heard about Jesus. She heard about Jesus. What did she hear about? I'm sure that she heard about all the miracles that were happening. She came behind Him in the crowd and touched His garment, for she said, if only I may touch His clothes, I shall be made well. And again, be made well, it's sozo, saved. I will be made whole. But when she heard about Jesus, something happened on the inside of her. Her attitude changed. She began to see with eyes of faith. She said to herself, if I can just touch his clothes, I know I will be made well. Listen, think about this. After 12 years of disappointment, 12 years of treatments, 12 years of just trying everything. I'm sure that she had prayed and prayed. After 12 years, now she believes. And she says, I know that if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. And I want to tell you this morning, no matter how long it's been, no matter how many disappointments, no matter what you've been through, I want you to know that if you can get to the place where you have that kind of faith, I know I will be healed. God will heal you. You need to understand that. You need to know that. Somehow, after 12 years, in spite of all that happened, she believed that God would heal her. Verse 29, and immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Wow. Wow. Jesus didn't pick this woman out of the crowd and say, hey, today's your lucky day. She picked herself out. She said, I know if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. And she touches his garment and Jesus knew that power went out from him. How did she tap into that power? Faith. You need to understand that touching the hem of his, touching his clothes, that's not what healed her. That was just a point of contact for her faith. If I can touch his clothes, I know that I will be healed. His clothes didn't heal anybody. It was her faith that healed her. And you'll see that in just a moment. His disciples say to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? I mean, everybody's touching him and he's saying, who touched me? But she touched him with faith. He looked around to see her who had done this thing, but the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. How did she get well? Her faith made her well. How do I know that? Jesus said so. That's good enough for me. Her faith made her well. I don't believe that. I do. I believe what Jesus said. I believe the scriptures. I want to tell you, this religious world will tear down your faith and leave you with this skeptical, cynical, unbelieving attitude and no miracles will happen that way. You've got to get to the place where you believe the word of God. You believe his promises. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. His clothes didn't heal her. It was her faith that healed her. Who knows, but maybe this morning, somebody at the end of the service is going to say, you know what? I know I'm going to be healed today. I'm going down front for prayer. I know I'm going to be healed today. Guess what? They'll be healed today. 
He's not a respecter of person. He doesn't show favoritism. No, this is for all of us. Verse 35 goes on with the story, though it tells us that in the next moment that men from Jairus' house come and tell Jairus that his daughter has died. And in verse 36, Jesus simply says, don't be afraid, just believe. Wow. Just believe. Believing is the key. So they go on to Jairus' house. When they get there, there's all these people mourning and wailing in sorrow and sadness because they they said the little girl has died. And Jesus puts them all out. And only Jesus, Peter, James, and John, and the parents are allowed in the room. By the way, Peter does this in the book of Acts when he raises somebody from the dead. He put everybody out before he prayed and raised that woman from the dead. Why? Why? Because Jesus wanted the unbelief out of the room. I want to tell you, unbelief will drag you down. It is a fight of faith when you're looking at illness and sickness and you're standing on the Word of God. Years ago when my wife was first diagnosed with cancer, we didn't talk to very many people about it. We tried to stay away from unbelief. And over the years, as we fought that battle, we tried to, you know, stay, surround ourselves or only talk to people that we knew would agree with us and not undermine our faith. You know, you've got enough thoughts going through your mind of doubt and fear and unbelief. You don't need somebody helping you. But Jesus put these unbelieving people out. You know, they were wailing, they're mourning. And one of the things that I experienced during that battle was I felt sorry for myself, at least for a few moments. There were moments that I felt sorry for myself, and in maybe a few moments I kind of wanted sympathy. But you know what? I had to get a hold of myself. You say, it wasn't you. Oh, listen, I've got to tell you, it is worse than if I had it. I wished I would have had it instead of her. But I had to get a hold of myself because here's the thing. If I believe that she's healed, then I don't need any sorrow. I don't need any sympathy. I got cause to rejoice instead. And so... I'm just telling you, Jesus put the mourners out. And when you believe that you receive, you don't need to be sad anymore. You don't need to feel sorry for yourself or sorry for somebody you're praying for. You need to rejoice and believe. Jesus said in Mark Mark 11, 24, what things soever you desire when you pray and believe that you receive, you shall have them. Jesus' words, some faith preacher said that. That's right, Jesus He preached faith. He never preached doubt and unbelief. He always preached faith. He always talked faith. He's the one that said, this. it's not some preacher. It's not me making this stuff up. He's the one that says your faith has healed you. Jesus raises that little girl back to life. In Mark chapter 10... A man called Blind Bartimaeus calls out to Jesus that he would have mercy on him. And Jesus says, what do you want to do for you? And he says, Rabbi, that I might receive my sight. And in Mark 10, 52, Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. What made him well? Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. I'm telling you, you got to get a hold of this. Faith is the key. He said, your faith has made you well. If you accept the religious attitudes of the day, it will cripple your faith. But if you'll believe the Word of God, if you'll stand on the Scriptures, I'm telling you, you will be able to know that the Lord really is your healer. In Mark chapter 9, a man brings his son to Jesus. He had a mute spirit. And Jesus, or excuse me, he tells Jesus... In Mark 9, 22, he says, If you can do anything, have compassion on us. Now, Jesus had compassion. 
But this guy, he says to Jesus, if you can do anything, I want to tell you God can do something. If you can do anything, help us. And Jesus says to him, what a great promise. He says, if you can believe, if you can believe. See, when the man comes to him, he says, if you can do anything, you know, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus didn't go, okay. No, he said, if you can believe. Now, some people say, I don't like that. Listen, you're going to have to take that up with God. But without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please Him. We have to believe. We have to trust Him. We have to take Him at His word. If you can believe, all things are possible to Him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. He didn't have perfect faith. We don't either. Let me tell you, our faith can't be in our faith. Our faith is in a loving, compassionate God. And this man, he says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And man, did Jesus ever help his unbelief because he healed his son. Your faith doesn't have to be perfect. See, that's, that's another deception of the enemy. He'll try to make you think, oh, your faith isn't good enough. Remember this story. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And did he ever? His prayer was answered. Jesus taught faith. Put that scripture up, Mark eleven twenty four. I just want them to see that. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask for when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Believe that you receive them. Believe that you receive them and then you will have them. Wow, what a fantastic promise from the Word of God. You know, it's a really exciting thing when you've been sick and then you get a good report from the doctor. Say, oh, praise the Lord, I'm well, I'm healed, or I'm better, whatever. So exciting. And I'm, I don't mean to sound sarcastic. I mean, for real, it's an exciting thing when that happens. But here's what i got to say about that. Who wrote that report? I don't know, some guy in a lab somewhere in Tennessee or something. You don't even know that guy. And you're all excited because he said you're better. Amen. Do you know this one? How about what he says? How about if we put more trust and confidence in the word of the Lord than some guy in Tennessee that looked at our lab report? Amen. Some of you thinking way too hard about that. I'm just telling you, we can trust God. His word is always true. Yeah. And we need to believe the promises of God. The Word of God will bring faith. Psalm 107 verse 20 says, He sent His Word and healed them. In the Word of God, I'm telling you, there's so many promises. If we'll just believe, we can receive. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Do you know whenever healing is preached, people believe and are healed? And when it's not preached... Hardly anybody ever gets healed. We need to know the Word of God and the Scriptures that speak, the promises of God that speak of healing. And we need to keep believing. Keep on believing. You know, sometimes miracles happen. They're instantaneous. Sometimes they take a day. Sometimes they take a week. Sometimes they take years. Believe. Now, when my wife was dealing with cancer, she prayed one day and she said, Lord, show me an example in the scripture of somebody that it took years for them to be healed. That night, in the middle of the night, three times a verse reference came to her. Romans 4.19. Romans 4.19. Not the the words, just the reference. Romans 4.19. She didn't even know what it was. She got up the next morning. She didn't think about it until she was having her devotional time and she remembered and she thought, oh, i got to look that verse up, Romans 4, 19. Here it is. It's talking about Abraham and not being weak in faith. 
He did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham and Sarah had gotten a promise from God 25 years earlier that they were going to have a son. Now Abraham is a hundred years old. Sarah is an old lady and she has never had any children. She has always been barren. But Abraham believed God. He didn't consider how old he was or the deadness of Sarah's womb. 25 years. Sometimes there's a trying of your faith. Believe anyway. Stand on the promises and the word of God. His word is always true. I know a lot of people are so skeptical and, you know, they just rationalize when people are healed. But I'm telling you, you need to know for yourself that it is God's will to heal. If you don't know that it's God's will, you can't really pray in faith. You need to be able to believe that God is going to heal. Now, Jesus taught us to pray this way. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the perfect will of God in heaven, there's no sickness. And so when we pray according to the will of God, we're praying for sickness to be healed. In 1 John 5, 14 and 15, it says, This is the confidence that we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we've asked of Him. You need to know that healing is for you. If you don't, you can't really believe. Here's another healing in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. He came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him, and behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, if you're willing, see, if it's your will, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put, his hand and, uh, put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. I love the way the Living Bible says it. The leper says, if you want to, you can heal me. Jesus touches the man and says, I want to. I believe he wants to. That's the key is we have to believe. you got to believe that it is his will. He says, Lord, if you're willing, you can heal me. Jesus said, I'm willing. Do you think that's only for that man? No, it's for you and it's for your loved ones. It's for that person you meet at work that's struggling with an illness. And the key issue here is can we believe? It's not just for certain people. Oh, you know, certain people, special people, certain times, certain places. Make up your mind. The Word of God is true and it's for you. Sometimes in foreign countries, people hear the Word of God about healing, and the first time they hear that message, they get healed. And that can happen here. But sometimes there's such strongholds of unbelief that have been established through the teachings of men and through uh, the reasoning of man that we have to... Hear the word of God and the message of healing. Many times we have to dig into the word and use it to tear down those strongholds of unbelief so we get to the place where we can really believe. But don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not talking about works. I'm not talking about you're earning something from God. I'm talking about you get to the place where you can believe. And whether that happens in one message or it happens over a period of time, but you got to get to that place where you really believe that healing is for you, that healing is for your loved ones. Now, in this church, I'm going to tell you, we have had so many miracles of healing. 
I'm not, I'm not just talking about, you know, somebody got better. I'm talking about we've had miracles of healing. And, and you just got to see for yourself. I, I, it just blew me away in the first service this morning. But if you have ever, you or a loved one has ever had a miraculous healing, I want you to stand up. A miraculous healing. Now, you look around here. By the way, there's about three times as many in the first service. Just saying. It's an older crowd. <laughs> I tell you, as you get older, you got more times, you got more opportunities to get healed, right? Nobody's going to say amen. Well, anyway. But nonetheless, I want you to know, even this group right here, that's a lot of people. These are people that believe they've had a miracle of healing in their life. Don't tell me miracles don't happen. Don't tell me God doesn't do that. You look around these, you talk to these people. They're standing as a witness that God has done a miracle of healing in their life. He still does miracles. All right, the rest of you stand with us, all right? We're going to pray.